Welcome to another Chamber of Commerce uh, live TV segment. Today is about the lockdown and its impact economically, mentally, support measures, and is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I'd like to remind our viewers that the Canary Banks and Chamber of Commerce Live TV was initiated during COVID 15 months ago as part of our commitment to keep connecting with our members, the community, stakeholders, and most importantly, to keep sharing our stories and advocating for our community in general. I thank our sponsors, and on this occasion, the Local Jobs Program and SSI. The Local Jobs Program is a federal government funded initiative designed in response to the impact of COVID-19 to support union employing the right staff. The Local Job Program employment facilitators from SSI will work with you and other key local stakeholders to develop employment solutions at local level. Please reach out to me and I can connect you. I would like to welcome our speakers, who in return they bring their knowledge, experience, passion, dedication to support you and help you to navigate through these difficult times. We are going to continue sharing stories affected by the lockdown because there are equal and long-term pain and suffering. Hence, policy makers need to see it and hear it. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Mark Condi, a community business leader, CEO for a major hospitality operation, Banks and Sports Club, that has major community footprint, employing around 600 staff, supporting many local junior sports groups a builder of business. Rami Yakmur, founder of Rache's, a family-friendly restaurant, franchise that now has over 30 locations along the east coast of Australia, employing around 2,000 staff, a self-made man and entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and he practices what he preaches. George Johnston, director and economist at Collaborate, a management consultant firm with additional accountant digital marketing and PR services, a problem solver. The Honorable Damien Chitterhoff, Minister for Finance and Small Business, who has been a great friend of the Chamber and the region, a good listener, team player, and never shied away from a difficult conversation. Let's get our conversation going. Mark, reading from the club 2019-2020 annual report, and I quote you, our entire team was able to demonstrate strength business-minded leadership and determination to place the best interests of our staff, members, and our community at the heart of all we do. We are in week five of lockdown and has been extended to another four weeks, simply 63 days in lockdown. How has your business operation been impacted and what parts of your business are closed? Yeah, thanks, Wally. It's uh, been a tough time for all of us, um, particularly the hospitality industry. Uh, we have 600 plus staff uh, stood down. Uh, we had to make the tough call uh, two weeks ago to stand them down also without leave um, or without paying leave, um, knowing that if we continue the, way, the rate we are, uh, we wouldn't be unable to continue paying. Um, in terms of revenue, uh, two and a half million dollars a week we're losing in terms of loss of, uh, loss of revenue and about 1.3 million in cash a week. Um, so if you can times that by five weeks with potentially another five weeks, uh, it's a significant disruption to our business. Our whole business is completely shut down except for the operation of the Flinders Centre, which is our commercial tower. When you approached your staff, how did you feel? Look, unfortunately, this is not the first time. We had the lockout lockdown last year, and last year was quite confronting. Um, this time around... Uh, Again, unfortunately, we're probably a little bit more experienced in, in, in going through that process. Uh, and the staff, I think, were expecting what was coming. We were in a far different uh, situation this time around compared to the last lockdown last year financially, which was at least a blessing for us. Um, but it's tough. It's tough for our staff, uh, and it's still tough for our staff. Uh, we reach out to our staff um, every, every two days via WhatsApp group um, and staff Facebook page, Tonight we're doing a live uh, town hall YouTube session for, for our staff. We Last week we had over a 1,000 views of that, that recording. Wow. Um, and the idea, though, is just to check in on them to make sure that they're, they're okay. Um, because my biggest concern is not only the, the cash bleed for the organisation, but for us to open again, we need our staff. 
Um, it's impossible for us to open without them. Um, and so we need to make sure that their mental health, their financial health um, is, is going okay. Um, and the big problem at the moment is their mental health. Um, a lot of our staff, um, either on opposite ends, a lot of them have big families and having to live off $600 a week, although that's been increased to seven fifty now, which is better. Um, but we also have a, whole, a, a number of staff who live by themselves, stuck in four walls in a unit, haven't technically been able to get out for five weeks other than just for exercise. Um, so their mental health um, is our major priority, and so a lot of our executive team is spending most of their time during the day reaching out to, to them. Bankston Sports Club is renowned for investment, growth and prosperity. Uh, Flinders Centre was one of your uh, you know, last key projects, and uh, we are now expecting to see the rooftop. Uh, Lady Banks, can you tell us more about it? Yeah, the Flinders Centre has uh, been a great investment for us. It's the only thing that's generating some income at the moment, so um, God bless the Flinders Centre. Um, part of that growth of the Flinders Centre, though, was to open uh, the Lady Banks rooftop bar. Um, we made a decision at a board level last year, once we reopened and once uh, our finances improved, that being a not-for-profit, our responsibility is to re-employ people. So during the last lockdown, we lost 120 staff through restructure. Um, that was the first time in our organisation we've had to do that, um, and that still hurts today. And so our goal was to reinvest the money that we have to create more spaces and places so that we can employ more people. Lady Banks was part of that strategy. We invested close to $5 million building that. Um, we had 40 staff recruited and ready to go. Um, and unfortunately, the day that the builders handed over that site to us was the day that we went into lockdown. So we've got $5 million sitting up there uh, and four, uh, 40 staff um, who had to be stood down before they started. Um, so that hurts. Um, that's part of our cash bleed because we've obviously still got to pay that. Um, but, you know, our staff are, are remaining focused, our executive are remaining focused, and we will um, open Lady Banks when, when we reopen in time. Uh, what is exciting about Lady Banks is that um, it's the only and largest rooftop bar that we know of in Australia. It's an amazing view up there. You can see the city, you can see the National Park, the Blue Mountains. Um, we think that uh, Lady Banks will equal, if not better, any other rooftop bar whether it be in Sydney, Melbourne or overseas. And so we're quite excited to offer such an amazing facility to Bankstown because I think Bankstown deserves it. I, I, very inspirational and I feel like you're adding value to Bankstown as a destination. But it's a simple question. Why would anyone invest into tourism or hospitality at the moment with this kind of uncertainty and ongoing disruptions? Look, I understand that the fear. Um, at the end of the day, though, the way I position it in my mind, and it's the only way I get through and wake up in the morning, is that this is a one in a hundred year pandemic. There's no rule book. There's no book on a shelf that says this is how you run these things. And that's whether you're at a, a, an employer like us um, or whether you're sitting in government. Um, it is a tough, tough decision and I feel for everybody um, you're balancing the livelihoods of people, um, their finances, their mental health, their businesses, the businesses that they've worked through all their life. Uh, and then you're also balancing people's lives. Um, and so my only hope is that we all stay strong, uh, we stay focused, uh, we will bounce back. And the other thing that I'm looking forward to, if, if it stays true, it's a one in a hundred year pandemic, so I won't have to worry about it again. <laughs> Very, again, it's just inspirational. Look, from a business perspective, operation fixed cost um, ongoing, whether you open the door or not. Um, how are you managing your operating costs? Yeah, there's a fallacy in... You know, I know some members of government have mentioned it. They mentioned it last lockdown that they want uh, businesses to go in hibernation. <laughs> you know, if that was true, that would be wonderful. Um, it doesn't exist. Um, it's not real. Um, so outside our, our principal payments on our mortgage and the interest, yeah, the banks say that they're going to look after you, but not that confident. Uh, this time around, they're being a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, banks are banks and they still need, you know, they've, they've got their own costs and borrowing costs and operational <laughs> costs. So... Yeah, you can manoeuvre a little bit, but there's still a cost. Um, there's still a cost to clean uh, for security. Um, there's still a cost for power and, and, and water and gas and the other things that still need to tick over. Um, there's a cost of keeping things running, so you can't just shut air conditioning down for six weeks and expect that it's just going to uh, turn on again and work. Um, there's insurance costs, because we still have a building that needs to be insured. Um, and there's, so there's a whole stack of other costs that, that exist. Um, and so hibernation is a fallacy. Uh, and that's, that's part of the reason why we're bleeding the 1.3 million a week. Wow. 
to the policymakers, uh, dipping into our cash flow and drawing on our savings for no fault of our own, that's not fair. And that's why we're calling on policymakers and decision makers to create a balance between health and the economic factors because the effects of the lockdown are going beyond and they are long term and they can affect our future generations. Uh, Rami? Wally? How are you feeling today? <laughs> I'm good, man. How are you going? Thank you for uh, coming on board and sharing your insight and your knowledge and your experience. Health is being ranked over all else. What are you hearing and seeing and experiencing in your local Russia's community from an economical impact, social impact, mental health impact? Look, for us, we're, we're right across the East Coast, as you said. So we, we're dealing with so many different things. You know, we're dealing with different states' lockdowns and we're dealing... You know, and not only that, now we're dealing with different LGA lockdowns, different rules, different regulations. So it's very hard on a business like ours in the sense that, I mean, so I think I should give a little bit of history about myself to get the, to get the listeners to understand where we come from as well. So my wife and I started the business 23 years ago. And you start a small business like most entrepreneurs who live out this way in the, in the LGAs that are currently locked down. Um, so... We, our understanding of running our business is, sure, we're medium-sized business, but we're still very family-orientated. We're not so much of a corporate organisation. You know, just listening to yourself, Mark, I guess you've got a challenge of pleasing uh, the, the board and the rest of it. The, the rest, the, for us, it's all family. It's all, it's all something that we built. It's another baby for us, our business. And that's, uh, that's who I feel for the most. And when I speak of that, I speak of my franchisees now. So... You know, we've got the franchisees who run under us and they're all families, they're all mum and dads who've got their kids and they're the ones who... It's not so much the the financial part that I'm stressed about because at the end of the day, we live... You know, we can debate what the government is doing right now in regards to the funding and, and how much they're giving us and how much support. Um, but the more important thing, I think we're going to get through this financially and I honestly believe there's a boom and there is a massive boom at the end of this. When we come out of lockdown... I know for the hospitality sector, I know for the like hairdressing sector, for all the anything that we party or go out or any sort of entertainment, there's going to be a massive boom. So that's not my concern. I'm really not worried about the financial impact at the moment as much as I am about the mental health. The fact that I've had to learn how to become a psychiatrist and a psychologist in the last year, year and a half, and quite frankly, and I've got to say this, and I'm going to speak on behalf of the entrepreneurs out there. The entrepreneurs are people who sort of are, you find they're, they're sort of gutsy people. And they're, they're not the first people to put their hand up and say, hey, I need a hand. That's why they've gone out there and have made some, some what do you call it, some, I guess, um, some, uh, str not strong, some aggressive moves, I guess, in the workplace to, to grow their business, right? So we're not the kind of people... And I'm speaking on behalf of myself and other entrepreneurs. We're not the kind of people to put our hands up and go, hey, guys, I'm, I'm hurting mentally. I'm not in a good place. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm seven, a day, seven, days, seven days a week working at the moment, thinking about my business, not sleeping. We're not those kind of people. And they're the people who I've been speaking to at the moment in lockdown. They're the people I'm really worried about. And I'm going to bring one example up, and I hope she doesn't mind. Well, I won't bring up her name then, but I spoke to a hairdresser last night. And she owns a business in the local Bankstown area. And she told me, Rami, I've got my staff and my staff are struggling because that's their social life as well. So when customers come in, when customers come in, that's how they get their social hit, if you like. That's how they release their pain. And she said, more on top of that, Rami, which I won't mention her name, like I said, almost spat her name out again. Um, the other thing too is when you go to a hair salon as a customer, Believe it or not, your, your hairdresser is your psychiatrist and psychologist as well. They listen to you. Absolutely. It's not that I have a hairdresser, but you know what I mean. Um, but so that's more my concern. And yes, I appreciate what the government is doing every morning. And we're getting up, we're getting up at 11 a.m. and we're listening to the 11 a.m. update. And I, and I respect where the government is thinking. But as much emphasis as they're putting on COVID and on the health and the Delta strain, and I completely understand where they're coming from. Everyone is trying to do the best they can. I have zero doubt about that. I have zero, zero doubt that our Premier and her team are getting up every day and, and it's blood, sweat and tears. But guys, you have to put yourself 
what I would say to the government is put yourself in our shoes. Understand, we understand. I don't know if everyone can put themselves in your shoes, but put yourself in our shoes. We are your customers at the end of the day. That's the way I simplify it. We are your customers. If I treated my customers with the amount of information you're giving me at the moment, and I say this with the most respect, <coughs> I say that with the highest respect, but if I treated my customers that way, they're not coming back to my restaurants. If I treated my franchisees that way, they're not franchising my business. I can't give you just a little bit of information and say you work out the rest. And I appreciate how hard it is. And as my friend Mark said, there's no playbook. There's no, there's, there's no rules at the moment. But guys, we have to, we, we need some leadership and there's got to be better leadership in there. I'm sorry, I don't mean to upset. And with all respect to our Premier Gladys, who I love, I love to death and I mean that. I think whenever she talks, she is, I, I just love it. I, she I, speaks from the heart. I, I hang on to every word she says. Do, do you feel that messaging should be better, more structured, uh, more effective? Should we hear more about the economical impact, uh, business losses? Uh, I think Cases like be, that, so I we can create a balance between health expert and the economical expert, and the public opinion can make a, a better judgment. I definitely think, Wally, that there's a, there's definitely more room for more transparency. You know, we mm. all knew we're going into an extra lockdown. Why make us hang on? We, as a business, and we're talking. About, I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of entrepreneurs now. Like, we got to Business is all about preparation. The more information I have, the more I can prepare. Now, I could speak now for myself. I Honestly, what I do is I've got to read between the lines. I make sure I watch the press conference three times because entrepreneurs are quite vigilant people. I watch it three times and I read between the lines. I read between the lines and then I know what she's doing next week. And it's sad and I feel sad for those smaller businesses. You know, I've got a team around me where we sit down and we've got to analyse. She said that, she, she means that. Or, sorry, this is not a, this is not just that Gladys at the whole team. Sorry, and I and honestly and I, and I understand they're giving blood, sweat, and tears. I'm saying that with a, and I understand why sometimes they can't be fully transparent. But we need to be more transparent with the business community. Thank you for that, Rami. Joe, you can hear the frustration, you can hear the passion, and you can hear that as a business, you need the business plan. Um, what is the emotional response you are seeing from your clients and the business community? You deal with a lot of small businesses through your collaborate. Um, firstly, you know, we look after clients that with your revenue between zero and 50 million. And they come to collaborate for all kinds of different reasons. Um, at the moment, you know, we are seeing a lot of frustration in our communities. Um, but one of the biggest problems that we're having, Minister especially, is, you know, when you see those bomb disposal guys uh, running, you should run. You know, when you see accountants uh, smashing their computers and throwing their phones at the walls, you know that there's a system breakdown. And, you know, we've got accountants. I'm an economist. You know, we're working with tax agents, BAS <coughs> agents, bookkeepers, and that's it. And we've also got, obviously, digital and HR and all of that. And we also, like Rami, you know, we're sitting down in our management teams and we're watching the 11 o'clock and we're losing two hours of our day just trying to unwind it because planning, strategy, cash flow, all of that matters. Now, I, I don't just manage my business. I manage 50, 60 other people's businesses um, holistically. And beyond that, we have the people that call us for an emergency, you know, or, or to vent, or to ask us if they're hearing it right, if they understand it right, if they're looking for emotional support, <coughs> someone to, to bounce their ideas off and then um, sometimes just cry, you know, and know that, the, uh, you know, we've got their back or we're trying to do our best and we're prioritising them. And, we have strong relationships with a, a lot of the professional services here in Bankstown, especially those that are members of the Canby Bankstown Chamber of Commerce. And we collectively speak with each other about, you know, what we're um, going through. And, and then we have to bill it to the clients, you know, the double handling, the double working, the getting up to question 19 and getting kicked out. <laughs> you know, um, and these are real frustrations experienced by professional people who do this for a living. Minister, I started the conversation with Mark, Rami and Joe to provide you with the opportunity so you can hear him, listen to their uh, key issues and the point of view. How do you respond, Minister, to the pain and suffering faced by the business community at large? Uh, thanks, Wally, and thanks uh, to the other uh, panellists who have joined you today. And, um, and I also thank all the other uh, members who are watching uh, this broadcast through Facebook. Um, 
for wanting to participate in uh, understanding um, how other businesses are coping with this problem, but also how uh, potentially the government is responding. So um, obviously there is um, massive concern about the impact on small business. Um, uh, for those who have done their research on me, I was uh, have come to politics late in my life and ran a small business for the first 30 years of my life and uh, ran a legal practice and uh, uh, childcare centres. And I have to say that I understand um, the problem of, that Rami articulated so well of the problem of going to bed at night and, and not knowing whether uh, when you wake up in the morning you've got enough money in the bank to pay the rent, to pay your employees, um, to pay your suppliers, to pay the bank. Uh, that's my definition of... Uh, ultimate stress because uh, generally that person hasn't slept. Uh, they've tossed and turned all night uh, because they uh, in a situation where um, everything that they've worked for, everything that they've wanted to deliver for their own family and for the people and the customers that they look after uh, is potentially uh, at risk. So um, from, from my own personal perspective, um, I want, to, I want uh, uh, people to understand that uh, uh, I personally get this and get uh, understand exactly the problems uh, uh, where people are coming from. I saw images uh, when this started, Mark, uh, of you having to get rid of uh, you know, food supplies, which you had in, uh, because uh, the speed of the lockdown just meant that all stock that you had uh, purchased uh, it was in danger of just being wasted. And uh, uh, I think that you cooperated with Food Bank uh, to make sure that a lot of that... Um, uh, food supplies uh, got out. Now, uh, the, the government uh, in, in its messaging has saying um, there are going to be lots of mistakes in relation to how we handle this. Is lockdown the right approach uh, to dealing with this virus? Um, the worldwide um, uh, reaction appears to be that, um, uh, that lockdown has been the tool of choice in terms of how we get on top of the virus. Um, However, I think the, also the language is starting to move towards vaccination as being the answer uh, to uh, stopping lockdown. And um, Canterbury Banks Down is at the heart of um, where government is focusing in trying to get on top of the problem at the moment. And all the businesses potentially in your area are a bit of the focus of the, the problem. I can still go where I'm living in, in Eastwood at the moment. Eastwood isn't nearly as much in lockdown. Early. I can still walk down the road and there are people in shopping centres uh, and the like. But Canterbury, Bankstown and the local government uh, or, uh, and that local government area is particularly impacted. So the starting point has got to be an encouragement uh, for um, people to get vaccinated. And I know that there has been a, sub, a substantial increase uh, in the number of people who are being vaccinated. However, uh, government's response having adopted lockdown and strategic lockdowns or targeted lockdowns in, uh, which are directed at local government areas has in fact developed a, uh, a package of responses. And, uh, and, I, and if you give me just a moment to uh, and people can come and talk about this um, during the Q&A session. But there are a number of layers now of support which we have put in place because although um, there, is, there is no package we can ever put in place to compensate Mark and Rami uh, for the weekly losses which they have for their business. Uh, if I had to pay, if we had to pay businesses for uh, those losses, a, a million dollars a week or $1.3 million a week in Mark's case and Rami didn't tell us what, what it was in his case. Well, I'm a customer of yours, by the way, Rami. Um, uh, but if we had, we, we just couldn't afford it. So there is a, a, a range of measures which we have put in place, which we hope gets you through to the other side. Now, Mark, you, um, and I, before I go specifically uh, to the, the packages, um, what we want to do is, is to make sure that we have in place a flexible system that businesses can make an application to government for assistance. Now, Joe made reference to the fact that sometimes you get to question number 19 and you'd fall out and that's when you're through 
and the phone at the wall or the computer at the wall and uh, just everything just collapsed in around you and you don't want to do this anymore. And, uh, and, and clearly that's a, a technology issue which um, we have to deal with. But as we stand here today, we've had 63,000 application for COVID business grants and we've got over $112 million into people's bank accounts. We expect that to, um, uh, to continue to go out. And one of the uh, really big um, uh, priorities of government is this, is that we want to be flexible in making sure that businesses do not fall through the cracks and where they have suffered loss that we get money into their account. But secondly, we want to get the money into their accounts as quickly as possible. And in the first week of opening the business uh, support grants, we were uh, tracking it at, at around uh, between four and seven days to get money into people's accounts from the time uh, that they lodge their applications. Now, uh, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, we are tracking that to make sure that money is getting out, out the door in, 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 uh, to businesses. So I just want to summarise where, where we are, uh, where we as a government are at in terms of what's available to businesses. The first, the first thing is, is the business support grants, which were open for the, which, which applied to the first three weeks of lockdown, because uh, when we first went into this, we thought hopefully we would be out of it uh, within 21 to 28 days, it's now gone longer, and uh, that's why there's a new package uh, which was announced in the last few days. So the, the, the business support grants were the 30% impact where you would get um, a $7,500 grant, uh, a 50% imp, uh, impact would get you a $10,500 grant, and a 70% impact would get you a $15,000 grant. Neither That was the original level of grants which were available. We are now moving from weeks four uh, to uh, the conclusion of the lockdown period. And there, there is a, a, a job saver scheme, which is also being administered by the Service New South Wales, which are delivering packages of between $1,500 and $100,000 uh, per week to businesses. Uh, and it's uh, an amount which equates to 40% of the payroll of that particular business. So if I can return to Mark's issue, 40% of the payroll uh, of the uh, Bankstown Sports Club potentially will deliver you a package of money and it may be as much as $100,000, which you can use specifically to meet the expenses, which, are, which you've identified as the non-hibernation expenses uh, to be able to actually pay those things uh, on a regular basis. Turning to the employees, the individuals who are stood down, there is an opportunity to go to Services Australia and for uh, employees who have lost more than 20 hours work a week, there is now a $750 a week payment. If you have uh, suffered less than 20 um, uh, hours reduction in work but uh, have had a reduction, uh, then it's up to $400 um, per week. So. They are, in many respects, job keeper type payments. It's not job keeper, but it is a, a, an equivalent uh, of uh, where we were with the amount of money going to people's accounts uh, to make sure that they were able to live from uh, live from day to day. So that is uh, an individual though goes to Services Australia, which is the Commonwealth Government grant scheme. For businesses who are seeking assistance, they go to Services New South Wales. And Service New South Wales has a two-tiered approach. It's the business, uh, the, the business support grants, and then we have now moved to the job saver grants uh, to assist those businesses. Now, there are whole lots of variations in, in relation uh, to to that, and there are uh, flexibility options. But I, I, I want to make this point: there are people who come to us and say, oh, "I wasn't in business in June 2019, but I've still." suffered a loss. Does that mean I can't apply? Answer, no, you can apply. It just means that your application will be handled, um, uh, handled manually rather than through an automated system. Uh, there are a lot of people who have uh, started work, uh, started their business in the last 12 months. What do they need to do? 
to be able to demonstrate their loss. Well, again, it's a manual assessment. And I say to Joe and all the advisors, one of the big things, and no wonder you won't run off your feet at the moment, but the important thing for business to do at the moment is get advice about those things which are available to them that they can, they can apply for. If you wake up every morning and you're stressed because you don't know how you're going to pay people, you should be getting advice about, is there some package which may be available to me that I can apply for, which will put money in my bank quickly, that I can meet my commitments, meet my electricity bill, meet my insurance policy uh, premiums, uh, potentially pay my, my, pay, uh, my rent. So I don't, I don't want to talk too long. I want to hear some questions, but uh, Minister, sorry, thank if you. I could, if I could just interrupt there, where do you go to see what's available, what packages are available for your yeah, small business? Sure, um, yeah, so I, I, and I wish I could. Uh, start? Sorry if I could yeah. just add on to the question. Even at my size business, and I'm calling my accountants, so we're dealing at very high level accountancy, and they're still saying, guys, you have to wait. The the detail, the devil is in the detail. The We're still waiting. We're, and then I feel more for those small businesses because I feel like they really have nowhere to go. But maybe you could uh, sort of put a bit of light on that. Yeah, no, no. And, and that's an important thing. There's a really, really wonderful summary uh, 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 about all the things which are available uh, at uh, the New South Wales .gov .au, uh, backslash COVID-19 support package website. Uh, and it goes through whether you're an individual, whether you're a business or a small trader or a small not-for-profit. And it talks about residential and commercial landlords. It talks about payroll tax concessions, payroll tax deferrals, gaming machine tax deferrals. It is a complete summary of all those things which are potentially available. So it, it's a really good question, but there is also, as a component of that, a business concierge service who will in fact phone you back. And I have to tell you that, that uh, well, I don't know where it is up to today, but yesterday the figures were that they had fielded over 22,000 or responded to over 22,000 calls uh, to the business concierge service, um, providing advice to people where to go, what grants were potentially available uh, to people. But if, if I could, uh, it's a pity I can't share this screen with you, but if, 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 yeah, I, I can potentially, I'll send to Wally, I'll send you the link to this screen uh, because it is the most comprehensive summary of everything which is currently available. Uh, and which member, your members should uh, access for the purposes of making sure that they know what's available. But And, 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 I, and I get it. Um, sometimes you get stuck in the headlights with this stuff. If I can just uh, explain from a, from a grassroots perspective, we, uh, we, we know what they all are. I could rattle them off the top of my head now. You tell me your circumstances, I'll tell you what you can get. Problem is yep. I can't get you it. So there's delays of two to three weeks. And I know that you said there's $112 million into the hands of the people that need it. But let me tell you just from the cl customers that I've worked with, two fundamental issues. And Rami, you mentioned hairdressers, um, you know, how tough they're doing. They're in pure lockdown. So, you know, they're, they're not in the same situation as I am where I have a 30% decline. They have a 100% decline. And the lockdown was happening on a Thursday. And if, if, if you know, a hairdresser is going to make most of their money, probably 80% of their money is going to come Thursday night, Friday, and Saturday. And that'll be enough to get them through the rest of the week for a maybe busy Tuesday, Wednesday. And the lockdown came before their money comes in. Now, the first thing that was announced was the um, emergency, the disaster payment. So the hairdresser runs out and avails of the $600 which later excludes them from any further um, support measures. If you got that, you don't get this. And they're missing out on up to $15,000 if they turn over um, 75,000 or more. So that was one fundamental problem. That I think that needs to be addressed, that if you got that before the second support was announced, that they roll it back or that they take it into account for special circumstances. I think the next fundamental uh, problem as well, $112 million in the hands of the people that uh, need it, they have 100% decline and they're expecting 15000 
So my clients, we sit there, we look at your cash flow, we go, right, who are your, who are your suppliers? You had to send back food. You're not going to take in the piece of equipment that you ordered. You know, can you put back for construction or something? Or can you put something back? You know, because you're the hairdresser or a barber or a gym, they can't afford it. Can you defer your payments on your machines? You know, um, yes, we've done it all before, so we sort of know what the plan is. And only 10,000 came in. So they're expecting 15, they got 10. So now we have to go back and we, we professionals, we have to charge them for redoing their budgets and their cash flows and renegotiate their terms because we told their landlords we were going to do this because 15,000 is coming in. Um, and that's really stressful. Um, you know, so, and I do appreciate that the amount's gone up, but we also knew that it was coming. And I, I do understand as well that you said that, you know, you can't afford to support businesses like Rami's and Mark's. But my question well, but we, is... No, no, we, I didn't, uh, we can't afford to, to compensate them for the totality of their loss. We, no, we no, must... I get that. We must afford them. We must I, support I get them. that. But if you had to, would you make different decisions? Because we've got to make all our payments whether we can afford them or not. But, well, uh, um, let, let me bring you, Mark, to the equation. Do you feel uh, the government support go far enough, in your opinion? And if not, what would you like to see? Uh, look, Wally, um, well, first, Minister... I, do need to thank you. We do qualify uh, to the hundred for the hundred thousand dollar a week um, uh, uh, subsidy, which um, you announced yesterday, which is fantastic. Um, so that's the first time that we've qualified for something for our, our size business. And and you know, while you, you I agree with you, it doesn't compensate us for all of the losses that we're going through. It certainly does help. So now I want to thank the government for for announcing that. And certainly, I want to thank the government for announcing the increase from six hundred to seven fifty. To, uh, for all of our staff that qualify, which, which is all of them. Um, so, you know, we're really pleased with that. Um, look, I, I agree, Minister, when you mentioned at the start that um, the way out of this is vaccination. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And so one of the things I did want to mention um, today is that uh, we've, we've uh, approached New South Wales Health. We approached them uh, two weeks ago. Um, and through the help of our team here, we've managed to secure a vaccination hub, uh, which will be open Excellent. here. Possibly, we hope tomorrow, at worst on Friday, we're giving the facility free of charge. Um, the one benefit of it is that they, um, it allows five of our staff um, on rotation to come out of lockdown, which is fantastic. Um, and they hope to do anywhere from 500 to 1,000 vaccinations uh, a day starting from tomorrow. Uh, again, That's we've provided brilliant. everything free of charge and, and we know that if, if we can get people vaccinated in this area, um, then it's it's our ticket to open our doors and get our people back to work. I, can I just That's comment on that one? I, I submitted an application for one of my clients who is in aged care, they're nurses. And as we know, we've got professional healthcare for, um, people leaving the industry because they've simply had enough. But we've put a proposal to Brad Hazard for um, mobile vaccine. So people that can't get out, people have phobias, um, you know, people who are caring for older Australians and family members in their homes um, because they're registered nurses, but they want to serve the well, not the sick. There's some people who don't want to go to the hospital, the super hubs, or, you know, other places where people are sick, like doctors or, um, you know, pharmacies. And I think, you know, for myself as a small business owner and on behalf of my clients, the vaccine rollout, the more we can get to the 80%, and, you know, the mobile nurses, they're willing and ready to step up and, and help in a different capacity for a break on their mental health. Yeah. And look, if I can yeah, add well, on to that. That's, that's under active consideration. We've reached out to the health is, uh, I agree, a lot of our, our community yeah. here uh, probably might feel uncomfortable going to the, the vaccination hub at Homebush, for example, but they should know the club. Uh, they should feel comfortable here. We have underground parking, have lift access. Um, so we're hoping that that's one good step towards, uh, you know, Solution. getting those people that's to right. come and vaccinate. And what I'm also, uh, you know, pleased to obviously announce is that uh, we've actually reached out to a lot of our community leaders, uh, those leaders that haven't actually been vaccinated. And so they'll, they'll be willing to come here and be vaccinated live so that we can hopefully encourage our community to come and get it done. Yeah. I, I went to my doctor and asked if I could have the AstraZeneca and he said no. But I've got mine, I've booked mine in for three weeks at, at Homebush. So on the 24th of August, I should be vaccinated because I'm between the 40 and 50 age bracket. So I'm doing my bit, I hope. Rami, do you agree with Mark uh, about government support uh, go far enough? Uh, look, I welcome all the government support. And, uh, and I honestly believe at the moment, especially with what's been announced yesterday, you know, the 
the, that we, now that we've boosted it from 60, 60, 7, 600 to 750 and $100,000, um, look, I, I welcome that. I think, um, I honestly think when it comes to the financial situation at the moment, I believe if your business, um, I mean, it's not going to meet, look, we're going through a crisis, we're going through a pandemic, it is what it is, that's, that's the cards that have been dealt to us, and I completely understand, but like what I said, if you I welcome what the government has brought forward, and I think if your business has been doing the right thing, um, there's enough to survive this four-week, hopefully, lockdown, and at the end of it, I'm, I could almost guarantee we're going to see a massive boom. Um, don't hold me to that, um, Minister. But <laughs> no, but I'll, honestly, we know what happened with the last lockdown, and I want to give some optimism to the people listening, the people with small business, and I want to say this is your chance for preparation. This is your chance to prepare yourself in the next four weeks, where the market's your club, and um, I'm not a supporter of pay commissions. I need to put that out there straight away. But I'm uh, I'm sorry for that. I'm more about family businesses and family staying together, and um, but. What I want to stress about that is, at the end of these four weeks, all those small family businesses, stay active, keep your head up, be optimistic, because I can tell you, like we experienced at the last, at the end of the last boom, like at the end of the last lockdown, with the boom that we had, and no one can, no one can dispute that. The government has got the records. The government has got the records. We saw what happened. I'm talking about New South Wales. We boomed. You're going to boom again. And you're going to boom in a big way. Minister, there's businesses going th uh, falling through the crack, um, which is good to bring it back to your attention. We're talking about newly started business. We're talking about building contractors and companies. We're talking on workers uh, who are works in the building industry and they stuck in the eight LGAs and at the moment they're not allowed to work. We're basically dividing communities. Uh, some commercial owners or managers are unable to support the tenants. How can we provide solution solution for those people? Well, um, uh, fi financially, I, I, I think that there are packages that are around, and, and what I would suggest to you is that if, if in fact there are people who say I am a business which can't uh, or doesn't qualify for one of the support packages which are currently available, um, I would be surprised as to why that is the case, and would encourage people to pursue an application in any event and get the assistance of a professional advisor to assist them in lodging that account, because that application, because there is, or, or alternatively, there's free, free advice uh, from uh, BizConnect uh, and the business concierge service. Because what, what, what it, uh, we are wanting to do is to say, well, if you haven't got a business activity statement or if you haven't got comparables for a period um, uh, in June 2019, what can we use as a replacement to assist you to demonstrate the impact on your business? For those who are locked, locked down and can't go to work, uh, I get it uh, that, that we need to be able to assist them and that's why uh, the, the, effectively they've lost all their hours and there is a $750 a week payment. So, um, uh, Wally, what I would be saying is, is that uh, there is a level of patience required, but there is also a, a, a necessity to acknowledge that there is the support out there to assist them. And there is also a 24-7 mental health uh, line, uh, which we have uh, funded with a, a package of about $17 million, because I, I get it that uh, there are lots of people who are needing, and Rami uh, identified this, they need to be able to talk to someone about the impact that this is having on them and on their family. Like I gave the example before we came on air about, uh, I, I have a fair few kids and I just think to myself, if I was in lockdown and had to educate and look after uh, homeschool all my kids uh, uh, during this sort of period of time, I'd probably be divorced uh, I, I just don't know that I could probably cope with it. And then at the same time, I have the pressure of worrying about my business. So there, let, let, let me tell you that I, uh, as, a, as a parent, as a, as a father and as a business owner, th this is sort of like as bad as it gets. And I have to say, Rami, I just love your optimism because uh, optimism is really the, the key or the panacea for 
um, a lot of potential depression which uh, businesses are going through. Use this as an opportunity to look at your business to say, how can I make it uh, better? When we open up, is it going to be a better product that I'm delivering? Because uh, what my emphasis and where I want this all to go is we want you to survive so that you can take advantage of hopefully the boom which Rami has identified because survival is the period that we want to support businesses through at the moment. Make sure that you get to the other side of this. And if it is rent that, that, that people, that there is an opportunity through the Small Business Commission to negotiate an outcome with your landlord. And if I can make this plug for the Small Business Commission, the Small Business Commission has a fantastic mediation service. And if you have a landlord is saying, no, I want all my rent, then and you can't afford to pay it, go to the Small Business Commission because the business, Small Business Commission has the power to call in not only the landlord, but he can call your bank, he can call your suppliers and have a round table about those things which are impacting on your business to try and reach an outcome with your landlord. So it, it is a really good service uh, that, that is available through them. And 90% of those matters which are mediated by the Small Business Commission resolve. So uh, it's, it's a question of being able to acknowledge that we have a problem where do I go to to get it resolved? And, and if I look at uh, that, that website, which I referred to everyone to earlier, there's a whole section uh, devoted to landlords uh, who are leasing commercial properties and also landlords leasing residential properties. Uh, so um, th the information is available. There's probably so much of it that people don't know, don't know where to access it, uh, but the uh, getting getting people and advisors to be able to or businesses to go to their advisors to get that information is so important to you the survival of those businesses. And so can, what can we expect next? Can we at least do to speed the, the rapid testing approach to help speed the uh, the construction? I can't hear you. I uh, I don't know if I'm. Can you hear me now? No, no. Yeah, you must be still. Someone's on mute. Uh, what can we expect next uh, regarding uh, rapid testing, for instance? Can we at least introduce that measure to the uh, uh, workers who are stuck in the eight LGAs? Yeah, I th that's, that's a fair call. Um, I'm not um, in the health portfolio, but all the information about ra rapid testing and what is available uh, in other uh, jurisdictions seems to suggest that rapid testing should be part of uh, the answer to getting people back to work. Um, uh, you know, Can I've you advocate had, for those workers, uh, Minister, through you at least? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it clearly, uh, you know, I, it's, it's a question for the health minister and the health advisors, but 100% uh, I am pushing for whatever is necessary. Like, uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me as a big problem, like, even the construction industry in those LGAs, you and a lot of the workers which work in those LGAs work in the construction industry. They want to get back to work. So we need a formula which allows the construction industry or whatever to be able to reopen, not only in the other parts of Sydney uh, or the CBD, which uh, it doesn't have the same level of impact, but even in those LGAs where, which have been identified as uh, high exposure uh, LGAs. But, uh, and I'll give you a personal example. My son is doing a renovation and he lives in the Parramatta LGA. Uh, the, the, the renovation has stopped. He's living in his garage uh, with two small children. Now, I, I can imagine what uh, the difficulties that they're going through because they say, why can't the builder who lives in the, the same LGA come to my site just to continue and finish this off so that I can get into it? So I... Uh, the, the, the problems which exist and which I advocate so uh, strongly for are to try and get people back to work because work is really what people want. They don't, they don't want to sit at home. They want to get back to work. And, and that's why, Minister, that's why, Minister, I think we need to have a balanced approach uh, when it comes to the policy making uh, decision process. And we need people from the economical factors or teams to be involved with the health and they work together because the side effects of the lockdown uh, at the moment, it's seen, as you can see, it uh, be goes beyond uh, people's expectation. It's a long-term effect, and it's going to affect our future generation as well. Uh, Mark, well, I look, saw you donating foodstuff to the food bank uh, when you made the decision to seize the operation. 
Do you have protocols in place for reopening? In terms of purchasing of food? Well, you, you've donated all your stock at the beginning. Now, basically, yeah. let's say we're going to go back uh, and reopening. What's won't your plan? You, won't you have to like put money back in your machines, back in your ATMs, put food back on your shelves? What's well, that going to look like? I, I think to the, to the point of... of, of which Rami mentioned, gaming machines. You know, our, our business is, is much much bigger than just that. So we have 14 restaurants, we have conference facilities, a hotel operation, a commercial tower. Um, and so, yes, those restaurants do require a significant amount of stock. Um, so we do have some stock that's not perishable on hand. Uh, but luckily we have some amazing suppliers, um, local suppliers. And so when we need to to, to re-ramp, to, to, to get ready, um, open, we'll, um, we'll manage to do that in a couple of days. Joe, can you see the health messaging at the moment is carrying population? Do you think that this will have a lasting impact on buying behaviour in the future? I do, um, and I think that there's particularly with, say, construction. As you know, I've got lots of, from sole traders to small five-man teams, uh, up to 25 workers. You know, that would be my bread and butter type of stuff. Um, when all of construction went down on that Saturday, I think I basically sulked for those two whole days for what was about to come for a big number of my clients. And I, as long as the whole industry was shut down, you know, their contracts were secure. Yeah, you know, with the announcement now that they're opening it up with two inside or five outside, I've got a lot of my subbies from this area who think that the job they thought they had booked in is now going to be reallocated to someone who does not live in Bankstown, you know? And, but beyond that as well, I worry about the future valuations of our businesses. You know, um, if, I want, if someone in Stratfield wants to hire someone, are our kids going to get hired? You know, because you're in Bankstown or Fairfield or Liverpool. No, I think I'll take some Canada Bay instead. You know, um, is the local convenience shop, if he's had enough if, and he wants to sell, can he sell? Is a local HVAC supplier, you know, electrical goods, are, are they going to be able to sell their businesses? What's happened to their valuation? Are they going to be able to get lending? You know, so the buying behaviour, am I going to choose to go to... Christie Centre up on Canterbury Road, or am I going to go to Alexandria? I think I could add to what you're saying, Joe, and what the, the important thing there is a whole ecosystem. That's what's at play at the moment. You know, we've got, um, you know, you said early on that you support sporting teams. You know, they're struggling. So no one is supporting the sporting teams now. Obviously, as a result of having restaurants, you've got the butchers that you supply locally. You've got the fruit and veggie. You've got the, you know, and so it's a whole ecosystem at the moment that's struggling. And you're right, that's all going to be... That's Reimagined. 100%. 100%. 100%. Rami, have your uh, customers supported you during this lockdown? Look, it's been amazing support. So, what, look, it, so again, a little bit about our business. So, we're 100% dining. And we've had to really, uh, when I say, when people ask me, what are you down? I say 100%. The reason we're down 100% is really my dining is down 100%. I'm not a takeaway and delivery business. I've had to pivot my business to takeaway and delivery. The cost that I have had to put into that has been, like, if I start if I start telling you the numbers, I've had to create a call centre. I've had to create a 30-man call centre. I've had to create an online ordering platform. I've had to buy cars. I've had to retrain staff. I've had to lose a lot of sleep, and not just me and my management team. So we've done a lot as a business. And I'll be quite frank with you, Honourable Damien, I don't know that I'm getting rewarded for that. I have to be honest with you. The amount of work, and I, and I don't, again, I don't want to sound like, I don't feel like I could have easily gone home and I know hibernating is a, <laughs> it's not real. But the fact that we've been able and been able to keep our staff on, that's a little bit of my, if I have one frustration, and not only have we kept our staff on in the last 18 months, and I know I'm sitting, putting a couple of tickets on the Richet's brand here, not only have we kept our staff on, we've actually grown our brand. We've employed more people. And we have refused to stand anyone down. I say to the staff, I say to the franchisees, look for opportunities. So if it means you go door knocking, go door knocking and ask people if they want to eat Richets. So I've got franchisees, well, we can't do knocking in the local LGA, but outside of it, that's what we've done. We've got people doing leaflet drops in mail. So, and I know this is, I could speak, in, I'm saying this for Richets and what we've done. And we're not getting compensated, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think I'm putting my business in a better place anyway for the future. I'm, I'm safe. I'm putting a, you know, I'm growing my business in a way. 
Um, I think for me, there's one confusing thing in regards to head count. Yeah. You know, keep your, if you can get access to the support measures and head counts. Because I think there's, um, if your staff, you stand down, see, I don't even know if they're stood down, they, they go and get the um, disaster repayment, but they're not a job seeker. Do they count as your head count? Do casuals less than 12 months count as your head count? Because I haven't stood down anybody either, but I assure you I'm getting paid less today than I was two years ago. <laughs> but they're getting paid a little bit more, you know, um, minimum wage went up. But the headcount is causing quite a lot of confusion. I've got a beautician who, um, you know, they ran out and got the disaster, the staff members. And, you know, she's going to get the 750 and she's very grateful for that. But it's nowhere near what she was earning as a, a cosmetic nurse. You know, um, so that headcount, if your staff go out and get job seeker, because that's what they chose to do before they knew about one thing or another, our ability to take advantage of a particular support measure is taken away from us because of their actions. So I don't know what the answer is to that, Minister, and I'd, I'd love to know more about the definitions and, you know, the workarounds and any exemption possibilities or private rulings that we can sort of apply for on behalf of our small business clients for headcount. Mark, any final message? Um, look, I, I think we all need to stay positive. I think, um, you know, we're going through a one in a hundred year pandemic. Um, it's been 18 months. Uh, we had, you know, the first lockdown, we had a, a boom as, um, as, as Rami just said in between, and now we're going through this uh, second awful lockdown. Um, when you talk about valuations of business, things like that, yeah, look, I, I agree, valuations may drop if you try to sell now. Um, but I think we need to look longer than that. Um, you know, we need to follow health advice. We need to follow what's going on. Let's get vaccinated. Let's get these COVID cases down and let's get our people back employed and our businesses open. Rami, any final message? Mate, I'll echo what Mark said. Um, just stay, you know, I think there's, stay optimistic and let's follow all the health regulations and support the government and because I honestly believe, again, they're getting up and they're making the best decisions they can for us. Minister, before I invite you to say the final message, um, our call to action, we want to ask through you, the government, to consider a balanced approach to combat the health and financial crisis because lockdown is causing equal and even more pain and suffering to our communities and their livelihoods and their well-being. So that's our message to you uh, and we would love your support to advocate that part to, to create that equal balance, especially for those policy makers who are making decisions regarding the lockdown. Any final message, uh, Minister? Yeah, well, uh, uh, thanks for having me today and uh, thank you again to all those people who are with you on this uh, Facebook link up. Um, I, I hear that message loud and clear. Um, the Treasurer has been a long uh, advocate of making sure that we get the balance right between uh, the health advice and the economic impact. And uh, in terms of getting the policy levers right, um, I, and he recognises the pain which lockdowns uh, are inflicting on businesses uh, across the whole of the uh, CBD area. So, but if I can reinforce the attitude of uh, be optimistic. When we came out of the, of the last lockdown, most businesses had a significant uptick in their revenues and their customer bases. So, um, if that is a model, uh, we ought to be wanting to make sure that we survive, take advantage of what is available. Uh, if there are anomalies that Joe has identified, whether it's headcounts or businesses which have fallen through the cracks, uh, sure, there are opportunities to reach out to the business concierge service to get some sort of ruling or um, uh, uh, opportunity. And Wally, if I can make this, if there are issues which your members want to raise through you, you always have direct access to me, and uh, if you, uh, if your members are seeking uh, specific um, consideration of, of issues which you want to raise on their behalf, by all means send them through to me uh, so that I can uh, hopefully return to you with some sort of answer. So I just say to people, well, the government is with you to get through this. We want to get through it. We want to keep people safe, healthy. Uh, at the end of the day and to make sure that this ends as quickly as possible. Well, to our viewers, I want to thank the Minister for his sincerity and uh, friendship. I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our sponsors, the Local Jobs Program and SSI. Uh, I want to thank this amazing club, Basin Sports Club, because it's been 
the home for all of us, and it's been the beacon uh, to drive this area as an amazing destination. So the final message, let's continue focusing and uh, let's work together to cross this hurdle to the other side and not, never give up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Minister. We're good.